Yesterday, Mark Andreessen, one of the founders of the well-known VC firm A16Z, released a Twitter thread titled, Why AI Will Save the World. I wanted to take this moment to share some of my reflections on it. So before we jump in, a little bit about myself. I'm 22 years old, and I'm also a startup founder. Before that, I was a hacker as well as software engineer. Mark Andreessen is you know, one of the investing greats. He's a giant, and A16Z is one of the biggest VC firms in the world. That's why I think it's interesting to see what he has to think about it. Why AI will save the world. It's like the intro tweet, that's how you form engagement. You say AI, and then you have the thread emoji. So you can tell that uh, Mark is not very good at using Twitter because he's trying to write a blog post on Twitter. He first starts off with an introduction of what AI is. He basically says that it's just linear algebra. He goes on to state that AI can make things better, just add water, it's like just add intelligence. I think that this is a bit of a stretch, but this is just you know the second tweet. I don't disagree that technology has the potential to improve the standard of living. Every child will have an AI tutor that is infinitely patient, infinitely compassionate, infinitely knowledgeable, infinitely helpful. I don't know how I feel about the phrase infinite love. I'm not sure if infinite love can exist. He goes on to make a case about personalization. If you think about the Sony Walkman, that was pretty innovative because you went from not having a personal soundtrack to your life to the ability to have one. The iPod made this 10 times better because you can have all of your music with you all the time. And then Spotify made it so that you can have all the music in the world at any time. And in the future, we could see that we have your personalized own individual soundtrack to your life at any given time. That's an example of personalization. Okay, because scientists will have an assistant, they will like be more productive and then they will like make more discoveries. I think there is a risk of treating like, you know, science and art as just like a box where you throw like people at uh, science or art and they make science or art like in Factorio. I think that's like a very managerial way to think about it. For example, there are problems out there that we've thrown billions of dollars of funding at like cancer and Alzheimer's that we've made uh, some progress on but are still far from, you know, a cure. I'm not sure if the creative arts will enter a golden age just because of AI augmented art. I do agree that AI will enable people who otherwise would not have been able to realize their artistic vision to realize it because it no longer, it reduces the entry barrier from to spend thousands of hours honing your craft. I'm not sure that throwing more bodies at the problem will result in better art. I think that art is a complicated process that involves taking what's inside of your brain and your qualitative experience of the world and your qualia and throwing that outside into the world. I think there's a lot of complexity here that's too easily glossed over if you just treat it as a factorio. I am not uh, familiar with the military and how it works, so I will not comment on this. Uh, I think this is like the same kind of thing that I would say if I was trying to shill a shitcoin. Granted, Mark, as a very large GP in A16Z, has big incentive to make the shitcoin go up where the shitcoin is like equity in a AI startup. Maybe more accurately, it's a Web3 startup that pivoted to being an AI startup because the VC money and Web3 evaporated. Comparing this to a moral panic, he's saying it's irrational. I think this is very funny because all the rationalists would have aneurysm or stroke because uh, Mark is now just using the rational card against them. It's like, ha, you're not being rational. I wonder how El Eliezer Yudkowsky feels about this. Uh, okay, I, I'm not reading this. This is like... This is just storytelling. Yeah, so VCs, they love storytellers um, because storytelling is how you create value out of thin air. When you create a brand story, people will magically want to buy your product more because they identify with the brand. This is why all of the logos this month have rainbows in them, except for the Opera GX logo, which is actually just two guys kissing. That's a very cynical take, by the way. The optimist case is, for storytelling is that people respond emotionally to things, and sometimes it's more effective to give something to people that is emotionally compelling and resonates with them on a personal level rather than just a financial or rational level. Baptists are people who, basically he's talking about Eliezer Yudkowsky, and then bootleggers, he's talking about Sam Altman. Okay, there will be people who try to entrench themselves by doing regulatory capture. Um, basically the same kind of thing that FTX was trying to do. Say that you're the good guy, everyone else is evil, Congress should listen to me. The Baptists are naive ideologues with the bootleggers and operators. I think it's, I think this is a bit black and white. Um, this makes for a compelling story because people like um, stories that simplify the world. I don't know about investment banking very much, so I'm going to not comment on this. So next he addresses the Doomer case. My heuristic for this is that people tend to think the world is over all the time. For example, 
Uh, people thought that COVID was going to wipe out humanity when it just instead wiped out the stock market until they printed several trillion dollars. Granted, there is some anthropic element here. I'm not very good at reasoning with Bayes' theorem, so I'm not going to talk more about it. What I find really disappointing so far about this Twitter thread is that although there are some good takes mixed in with the rest of it, I think that it is just so selly. It is like so focused on the storytelling. My gut feeling is that Mark is trying to replicate the same kind of bottled fire that he made with his original article, Software is Eating the World, that basically makes the case that you should not invest in anything that's not a SaaS company. I don't feel like that magic is in this thread because although it was very compelling and it was exuberant, I do not feel like it was dragging out Prometheus and mythology. I don't think it was making grandiose claims like it's going to save the world, it's going to, there's Baptist and Bula. It's almost as if this is a holy war. But if you think about it, this is only a really a holy war if you live inside of the 30 mile radius area around San Francisco. Imagine all the lonely bottoms out there that could be being topped right now, but their top is actually just topping a polylinear algebra. It's a little premature to come to conclusions about something that we don't have any existing data points for. It's very difficult to reason about what the risks are around AI because we've never had to reason about something like this before. This is the first time we're encountering it. I bet that if I take this, you know, this thread and I put it into an embedding model, there is going to be some dimension in that vector that is about how silly it is. And it's going to have a lot of correlation with terms like stratospheric. The next thing that he would need to bring out, for example, would be the fall of the Roman Empire. I agree that there's an entire industry that's going to come out of this that's essentially the AI safety grift. If you think about Web3, there was like a grift there that was like the blockchain security grift, and now there's like a new grift for like AI safety. The difference between that grift and this grift though, there's a clear like success and failure scenario for, for example, Web3 security, whether the blockchain protocol gets hacked or not and people lose their money. It's fairly black and white. Whereas here, it's very nebulous. You could argue that the black and white outcome is we die in like a AI holocaust or we don't. But I also think that there's like a large spectrum of bad outcomes that can happen along the way. And I'm sh not sure how we would measure that. And I, because of that, I think the problem is rather poorly defined. In fact, there's terms already like AI safety, AI alignment, um, AI like uh, security. And I think that these things are just being thrown around because it's easy to raise a lot of VC money on those terms right now. That's not to discredit the work of AI safety researchers. I think AI alignment and AI safety is incredibly important. I, I guess I shouldn't really be surprised because there's like, when there's a new arbitrage opportunity, there's like a new ARB, then people are going to like start trading into that ARB until it gets traded out. Uh, he's talking about how California has cults. I think that this is a very funny statement. The Bay Area is a cult. Yes, I agree. This is a thinly veiled shot at Sequoia Capital. Yeah, that's a good way to, to summarize this article. It's very extreme. I'm not trying to get all, you know, base centrist on you. I just think that I wish people would go outside and touch a grass. Wait, I can't touch grass because outside looks like this because smoke from wildfires up in Montreal that are being exacerbated by climate change. I think it's more accurate to paint it so as there are a bunch of people who feel very strongly about something because they have a niche set of philosophical beliefs that are centered around overthinking everything. And then overthinking things happens to be correlated with being very smart. And then being very smart is correlated with knowing people who have a lot of capital. And then because of that, the people who have a lot of capital became red pilled on thinking that AI is spooky. And then because of that, now there's like very large funds that are accessible to people who go say that they're going to do AI safety. And because of that, there's a grift going on. That being said, it's important to remember that the person saying the statement doesn't affect whether the statement's actually true or not. If there really is a cult, then there is a cult. It doesn't matter that it's Mark Andreessen talking about it. Will AI ruin our society? Um, yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I think the misinformation problem is going to get worse and worse. If you look at your parents' Facebook, it's really bad. Or uh, for me, my parents are Chinese, so it's their WeChat. He's basically saying that like all the terms are overloaded and this is not cool. I agree, the terms are very overloaded because people are just rushing to trade into the grift. Okay, so he's basically making a, a shtick about the culture war. Uh, some content is not allowed. And because of this, there is a slippery slope where we're going to make all the content that makes the people in charge not comfortable, not allowed. I think this is a, like a good point in some ways. 
I, I'm a proponent of uncensored AI models because I'm just like a you know crazy guy who likes to tinker on AI models in his living room using my graphics card. So I like it when I have access to more open source shit that I can fuck around with. At the same time, I do think it's going to get really fucking bad because right now already when I try to Google something, the results are fucking useless because all the top five results are just AI generated SEO dog shit. I think another assumption that this entire thread makes is that AI is going to magically get better as in like we just throw founders at the problem like Factorio style, that AI will magically become accurate and it will deal with all the issues like hallucinations and it will deal with all of the issues like making shit up and being confidently wrong. This assumes that like the current box of tools that we have like RLHF are going to magically solve the issues. And I don't think that's necessarily a sound assumption. I do agree with this at some level though, because I think that democratizing access to this technology and keeping it uncensored is very important for fostering innovation. It's very important that, you know, some uh, dorky 15 year old kid should be able to do machine learning and play with AI on his laptop. So up next is the classic capital versus labor debate. Mark says that, I guess he doesn't really subscribe to that. The fear here is, is that like machines, the people who control the capital, the money, are going to own the AIs, and because of that, they can use that to disenfranchise and disempower workers more. Because they'll have less need for workers and workers will be more disposable. That is what he's arguing against. What if this time is the same as last time? And what if this time isn't different? And what if it doesn't cause mass unemployment? My counterpoint to this is what if it's the same? If we look at what happened before or what's been happening, um, we've had a massive explosion in technology, you know, in the last century with powered aviation, space flight, and the internet. If you look at the United States, this hasn't really made people's lives that much better. I know that people will recoil to that and say that, well, I can get like DoorDash now and that's very convenient. But I will proposition to you that the median income in America is $31,000. And keep in mind that this is the median, which means that half of America is making less than this. I don't think that you can have a very good standard of living on less than or equal to $31,000 a year. I also think that despite our massive improvements in GDP and economic output, the wealth disparity in America has only gotten worse, which means that the concentration of capital has only increased. It's not so much that there could be job loss due to replacement. Bigger problem is that it could exacerbate the already extreme concentration of capital. I don't exactly have a degree in economics, so I'm not going to opine on this. However, the lump of labor analogy is interesting because it sparks a complementary idea. The lump of labor is on the supply side or on the sell side where you're the one providing labor and you're worried that the market for labor will be flooded by machines that can do the work for cheaper and will price you out and squeeze you out of the labor market. Think about the buy side or the demand side and more specifically think about the market for your attention span. People only have so many waking hours in a day and Americans are sleep deprived enough as it is. And because of this, there's only so many people in the world. So there's only so much time that can be spent viewing content. And when there's, you know, everyone is empowered to be an artist then what is going to determine which art is successful or not? Ultimately, it's going to be the platforms that distribute this content. The saying is, is that first time startup founders obsess about the product, whereas second time startup founders obsess about the distribution because distribution is often more important than the product. I want you to think about what is very popular right now in pop culture, Funko Pops. I don't think that Funko Pops are artistically very great, I also, for example, am not a huge fan of Baby Yoda. I personally think that although it's cute, it's a fairly commercial cash grab to just sell more merchandise. But the reason that these things are popular are because the platforms who have an incentive to sell more Baby Yodas, basically Hollywood. If you can just think of how many reboots are out there, this goes to show just how powerful distribution is. The promise of the internet was that it would democratize distribution and lead to a flourishing ecosystem of independent creators, which to some extent it has on platforms like YouTube, Twitch, Patreon, and so on and so forth. But the truth is that those platforms are also dangerously controlled by just large corporations as well. I believe that I've heard musicians complain all the time 
about Spotify's earnings for musicians, as well as they complain about how unaffordable it is to tour live because of the monopolization of the venues by corporations like Live Nation. Anyways, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that in the future, when you flood the market with artists, it's just going to disenfranchise and disempower the artists more because although there might be a greater volume of good art produced, the royalties and the earnings and the income will be, have to be split among so many more people that it's going to make it much harder to survive as an artist. And the power is going to rest with those who control who gets to be a successful artist and who gets to starve. Then I think it could become even worse when the power is even more concentrated into the hands of the few and the masses have to grovel at their feet in order to survive. Anyways, let's move on to the next section. Okay, so here he talks about wealth inequality. Okay, his premise is that to be a optimal capitalist, you want to seek the businesses that have the largest TAM or total addressable market. He says that capitalists have a incentive to democratize the technologies that they produce so that they can capture the most revenue. I think that although it is true that there is a strong incentive, the practical reality of how capitalism is happening in America is not necessarily good for the general public. For example, if we have the technology to produce insulin, then why are my diabetic friends struggling to survive because they cannot afford insulin each month? I don't think this is true at all if you just look at the past 50 years of American history. People have gotten poorer if you just look at the median income in America. The GDP has increased, but all of that capital has just become more concentrated in the hands of the few. Beyond material things like streaming the latest shows on Netflix, delivering the tastiest food on Uber Eats, or getting the shiniest new Apple accessories, there are certain things that are necessities. For example, healthcare, housing, and to some extent education. Yet my generation struggles to afford these basic things. I don't think it's true at all that the flourishing of technology in the past 50 years has necessarily benefited everyone. I think that this is just a cope that glosses over what happens to the bottom 50% of America. I am pretty privileged myself, so I don't know if I'm the best spokesman for those people. In this section, Mark essentially discusses AI risk that stems from misuse of AI. I actually generally agree with the points made in this section. First of all, because practically speaking, regulating GPUs is going to be impossible. Of course, this is essentially the same argument that weapons don't kill people, people kill people. And the current argument to that is, is that, well, if those weapons weren't available in the first place, that bad stuff wouldn't have happened. Of course, the counter to that argument, which Mark is trying to make in, throughout this entire article, is that the potential benefits of AI being available are outweigh the potential risk so much that it's a worthwhile gamble to pursue and let AI grow as quickly as possible. I don't think this is a good thing. I think that although it is possible to create privacy preserving implementations of proofs of humanity or proofs of authenticity, what's going to probably happen is, is that big corporations like uh, Nikon or Canon or uh, Sony are going to have partners with other big corporations like Apple and Google to create this closed garden ecosystem. And closed garden, of course, because they can charge royalties and rent seek on that closed garden, uh, much like the App Store, uh, so that you have to have a genuine uh, you know, certified camera so that your, uh, your pictures that you take with your phone or your camera or whatever are not marked as fake news. And I think that that's very sad. And in the future, imagine a case where if you do not, uh, you know, like, if you do not authenticate with your Apple ID or whatever, and that uses a secure enclave in your in your iPhone or your laptop, because you know Microsoft has Pluton and uh, Secure Boot and DRTM and stuff like that. Uh, if you do not do that, uh, everything you go to will have a big fat capture that takes five minutes to solve every single web page. Uh, it, that's an extreme example, but I want you to imagine a world like that, where by making it inconvenient to use the internet in a privacy per, in a privacy conscious way, that they essentially make it impossible for practically speaking to use it in a privacy conscious way. By put by by giving you all these nudges and friction on purpose, they can just corral people into authenticating with everything, so they can track you on the internet. So of course you can buy more useless shit. Uh, off of Amazon because they serve you more fucking ads for it. In this section, Mark is essentially trying to FOMO Congress into letting Silicon Valley do whatever because he's saying that there's a red threat. Uh, this feels kind of like the Cold War. I was not alive during the Cold War, so I will not opine on this. He proposes a simple plan where AI people do what they want to do. I fuck with this, actually. I agree with this fully. I think that open source AI is extremely important. 
I think that defensive capabilities need to be up leveled, but there's the classic defenders paradox, uh, or you know the security paradox, right? Or the it's the security problem where the defenders must be right all the time. They must be right every time, whereas the attackers only need to be right once. Very easy to take the factorial management approach where you say, I'm going to throw founders and I'm going to throw scientists at the problem and I'm going to have them make science, make more science per minute. Uh, but the truth is, is that these are like actually hard problems that may not have a solution. I am not going to read this section because it is fluff. And that is how we use AI to save the world. It's time to b -b 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 build. You should make a Delaware C Corp. So that was some of my thoughts on the article. I guess to conclude, I wonder what would happen if we talked to all the startup founders who are building an AI company and we asked them to explain transformers on a whiteboard.